I assume that most of you, that for most of you, this is the first lecture you've had in CVSP. There are lectures here this, uh, this semester on Monday, but you'd better cherish them because one possibility for the future is to uh, eliminate lectures so that you'd have three sessions with your student. That's uh, a, a controversial issue, but it is being dealt with. So cherish the few remaining lectures that you might have a chance to attend this semester before they go extinct. Now my job today is very simple, and that is really just to give you an introduction since we started on Monday, and uh, Monday is a lecture day. Instead of having nothing and you've paid your money, you get me to introduce you to the whole program. What is CBSP? Uh, what is CBSP? Just a few comments about it, just to orient you, and then your own teachers in the sections, of course, will take you much more uh, fully into how they wish to handle the semester with you. But just to give you a little bit of the history of this program, and to realize that actually since the year 2000, there have been uh, thoughts of changing it in different ways. We've gone through some, some minor experiments, but now we're at a place where uh, in the near future, the whole program might take a different shape and a different uh, possibility. The main difference is that primarily this, this program was a program, and everybody had to take four semesters. Even people who, in the past, at times, were in other faculties. <coughs> so wherever you were in the university at one point in the history of this program, everybody had to take a four-semester uh, journey. Hello down there. This, this thing is too high. I like to see everybody. OK. <laughs> a four-semester journey through time and through space, going from the most ancient cultures we have, civilization. And so first, let me just make a comment on some of the main points on the fly sheet. There was a human disease ravaging universities in the early 20th century. And that disease was creeping specialization. Specialization, very important. Extremely important, but the problem is it can push out the human aspect of what you're doing at a university. And that's why we have humanities courses at the university, but in, in its earliest forms, all universities, wherever they were, you know, whatever became universities, all started off really as focusing on the humanities. Now more and more, you're forced to take four if you're an arts and sciences student, uh, less if you're fortunate enough to be in some other faculty, I suppose, if it's fortunate from your point of view and right now. Later you might regret it. But in order to uh, at least <coughs> try to give some kind of an antidote, have, ever been bitten by a dog, a crab, a snake, uh, not a crab, but a, a scorpion, all right, a fellow student, a professor, all right. If you get bitten by something, you know, often you'll have to go and go to a universe, uh, so a pharmacy, try to get the antidote. Not always possible. During the war, my wife was bitten by an um arbarbin. Do you know what an um arbarbin is? It's a centipede. <laughs> and so in the middle of the night, she, she calls out Peter, and I thought, oh, how loving. At night, she's thinking of me. But she had, beaten, she had been bitten by, by that. And so we had to rush during the war, you see. It wasn't easy. We rushed to the closest hospital. They didn't have anything. They said, you know, so we had to go around looking for pharmacies that had the specific antidote for uh, that one. So the antidote to specialization, to try to prevent the full uh, effect on you so that universities don't become technical schools and just call themselves universities and call themselves that we're interested in the liberal arts and, uh, and the humanities and all of this. This program uh, started off primarily at Columbia University in what they call the Great Books 
program. Now, it wasn't just about books. The whole point was that it's, if you cut yourself off from the legacy of human tradition, not traditionalism, tradition, the legacy of what humans have found valuable and important all through the centuries, and if you just limit yourself to the present and its, you know, its vogue and its fashions and all this, it's a, it's a very poor way of developing your humanity. So the more you can access people from the past, and there's a man named Rene Descartes. Have any of you taken any Descartes in your high schools? I think, therefore I am. Right? I don't think so. Maybe I don't, I'm not, I don't exist. I think, therefore I am. Okay, Descartes, oh, I think I am. So Descartes said that speaking to people, you know, reading great books is like having a conversation with somebody who happens to be dead physically, but is very much alive in the book that you're reading. So in a sense, when you read some of these books, one way of uh, accessing them, apart from the sort of the clinical, uh, skill-driven, uh, uh, argument-driven uh, way, which is very important, but to try to see what were these people trying to say. So especially in, the, in CVSP, we look at cultures that have given us something that still uh, is affecting us today. And it's, and it's always good to become conscious, more and more conscious of the roots, of the sources of what, what's happening in the world today. So CVSP was meant to, uh, or what, what is now CVSP, it was first called, when it came to this university, a professor here who had gotten, who was studying at Harvard and got his PhD there, when he came back here, he, uh, he set up the first philosophy department in this area. And then from that philosophy department, came from his experience with this great books program, came what at AUB became in the mid-century, in the mid-20th century, general education, GE. I, as a student, was subjected to GE. For four semesters, I had to take you know, the, four, the four basic semesters of the program, and it was called general education. In other words, an education that will keep you awake and alert and aware of how much more is happening than just the specialty you're coming in for, just to get the BA, just to get the BSc, so you can go and do something else and, and get a job. And, and you, know, you, you, you rate, sometimes people rate a university in terms of the, uh, how job friendly they are, you know, how, many, how many people will they uh, get jobs for at the end. Well, that's fine, but you know, this is more and more looking at a university like a technical school, not as a university, the very term, universal global, all right? We're interested in things that affect all humans as humans, wherever they are and wherever they were. <laughs> and we can't access them physically unless you get into some kind of esoteric or occult activities, but you can't access usually a dead person uh, except through some, you know, their books, their architecture, their all, all, the, all the things that they have produced, the wonderful creative things that they have produced that have affected people throughout the centuries and continue to affect us. So looking at these books, uh, as something very important to be complementary. I don't know why this one has complementary. The one I used yesterday had complementary. <laughs> Different uh, editions of this. Complementary means for free, you know, or uh, an invitation. So please correct some of these uh, typos for uh, complementary, compl not complementary. All right. Uh, cultural. So it then became cultural studies. Why? For a very important reason, because cultural studies in, uh, spe specifically in Anglo-Saxon universities, but then more and more uh, also in Europe, cultural studies came to be a kind of a, a one of the social sciences, like sociology and anthropology and uh, you know, things like that, social sciences. Now the social sciences have a humanities aspect to them, of course, but social sciences study the human being primarily by empirical research, studying you know, the, the, their, 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 their mores, their customs, their, uh, uh, their artifacts, all sorts of specific things. By studying them more and more, so you get more specific information about a culture in, from a social science study. In a philosophical study of, social, of, of the human being, and that's why in a little while I'll tell you why, we, when we, for many years we thought of CVSP as a, a kind of philosophical anthropology, not a uh, you know, so a behavioral anthropo uh, anthropology, but rather a uh, philosophical anthropology. Anthropology means, anthropos is 
man. And logos means giving some sort of rational account of, you know, trying to sort of put into some uh, rational form or to study it uh, you know, through logos. So philosophical anthropology, what does that mean? That means primarily that as we study these cultures, we're trying as much as we can, and it's always going to be limited, but it's better than nothing, and it can be much better than nothing. We try to get ourselves into the place of, into the shoes of the people who were presenting these books. All right? So, for example, you're, doing, you're starting with the Epic of Gilgamesh, the hero there, and heroes are usually, in, these, in this literature, meant to be kind of a role model for, or a way of understanding the human being for their culture. So, when you read Gilgamesh, or you read Odysseus, or you, re or you meet Odysseus, and you meet Oedipus, the one who had to kill his daddy and marry his mummy, you get that in the Sophocles' uh, tragic uh, work, Oedipus. Okay, when you read these figures, don't immediately judge them in terms of your present standards and the way you think, and, oh, I would have done that, or I would have done that. That's wonderful. You can do that much later on, and we'll be very happy that you have your own views on this. That's wonderful. But your own views can only become mature and serious uh, and dialogue-worthy, worthy of dialoguing with other, if you take the trouble to put yourself in the place of, in the context, of a Gilgamesh, in the context of an Odysseus, in the context of an, of an Oedipus or an Antigone. If you don't do that, you will never reach the empathetic level of, of, of knowledge of other human beings, an existential knowledge, a direct acquaintance and, and relationship knowledge. At university, we primarily focus on knowledge as theoretical and speculative and, and all that, and all that is wonderful. But that's not meant for us to forget that the heart of our humanity, and for us to be able to do all that stuff, we need to be the kind of human that can best do all these things, can best be a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer or, a, or whatever one is doing. The more the, the, the human thing is there, and you, of course you experience this whenever you go to a hospital or whenever, you, when you're in a, in a building that's about to fall down, you know, you think of the engineer, you think of the, of the doctor, and, and you hope that, that, you know, these people have been paying attention to the growth of their own humanity <laughs> in a human-friendly way, so before they either build bridges or build your building or, uh, or, or, or you know, take your uh, heart out or something. God forbid. So, we're looking at knowledge that we can get through acquainting ourselves with another culture, any culture we do it, even when we do it for cultures today, it's the same process. But now we can at least, we can, you know, we can have an immediate direct experience of the culture. But this gives us a window into a variety of human experience where we can really dialogue, that's the fourth point there, where we can really dialogue with humans humans of the past as well as humans of the present. Dialogue, you know, dialogue has become a great, uh, you know, thing, a great uh, a buzzword, a, a slogan, whatever. But in my humble opinion, in the few years I've lived, and I know you think I'm 77, but really I'm only 76. In these few years that I've lived, at, mostly at universities, okay, and we've been into dialogue, and in the social, of course, in Lebanon, I lived here all through the war. Dialogue is so important, but you know, the only really dialogue that I've ever experienced uh, and having and at serious levels also, not just at university, is with people who are ready to try to put themselves into my shoes while I try to put myself into their shoes. <laughs> when we try to get an, uh, an empathetic understanding of each other, we, we won't necessarily agree, all right? God forbid that everybody agree on everything, the world would become very dull. But now we can have a truly respectful and empathetic dialogue where we can really contribute to one another. We can really learn from one another and uh, help each other uh, you know, to, to see something that's not as uh, good as we could get. So dialogue with humans of the past requires now for us, now when you do Gilgamesh, for instance, to when you read the story of Gilgamesh, to put yourself, to try as much as possible, put yourself into the shoes of this guy, of this symbol, of, this, uh, of the human being, Gilgamesh. See what he does, okay? And just to give you a few concrete ideas that you can then think about, you reject, you can, or not. Gilgamesh, and that's the first work you're going to be reading, <coughs> but I'm going to use it just as an example of the whole exercise of, of uh, 
dialogue of cultures and, uh, and, you know, and, and interaction like that. Gilgamesh is, first of all, a great king of Uruk, and he is an absolute ruler. He, oh, he, you know, he can do whatever he likes with whatever he wants. Total, you know, no, no limits, no restraints, all right? Now, the people, of course, have, see, already, there's a, this notion of this is not fair, justice. Why are we being treated like this? So the, as the story goes, they complain to the gods. Now, when you see the term gods, don't take them literally. Try to understand what each of these symbols represent. And in the world of Gilgamesh, for example, what, do the whole, what does the whole pantheon, what does the whole, uh, all of the gods together, what do they really represent? Might they not represent some kind of a projection of their social life? Okay. Some people in Lebanon think that, you know, that's what Lebanon is like. It's not my opinion, by the way. I don't want to get into politics. But they think it's the same thing. Lebanon is really being run by a bunch of gods. <laughs> and their real concern is only, you know, to keep order and peace between themselves. All right? So if, if this was a sort of, if, if, you know, for anybody who is silly enough to think like that about Lebanon, because we're perfect here in Lebanon. I'm, I'm a Lebanese, so I, mean, I, I, you know, I must let you know that. But in other words, this is the sort of thing that you have to kind of understand when you get in, start to see what this, the, the, the poets who gave us what became the epic of Gilgamesh over centuries, and this is centuries and centuries ago. This is the earliest work we now have that we can use uh, in, a, in a course like this. Basically, the gods there, all right, he, 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 he's, he has to respect them, they're more powerful than he is. Right? So respect is not what people think of as mature faith. Mature faith is not because you're afraid of this, whatever it is you think is God, all right? It's because you've, got, you've, had some, you've had some awareness and experience of that, well, this God, there, there is a God, there is something above me, and this something above me, you know, is trustworthy, and, and I can really, you know, go along and see what's happening with this, and I can try to be as good as I can in response to what I think this God is doing, you know. That, that's the heart of what mature faith is. When you worship something because you fear it, okay, you're in the world of Gilgamesh, you're in the world of the Odyssey, you're in the world of Oedipus, Okay, so that's very important for you to think about these things, about what is the divine, because not God, because God is only, you know, it has a different meaning in different places. So think of the category of the divine, and try to see how, whenever you're studying a culture, whenever you're, when you're ever, you know, trying to understand yourself and how you think about life, what for you is the divine? And then, as you think about it, you know, you start to become more careful about what, how, what, what it is, perhaps you understand it better than you might have thought before, or you find, uh, you know, uh, things that you wish to do. So, if you believed in the gods of Gilgamesh, and this Gilgamesh is all-powerful, forget the symbol two-thirds god and one-third man, that's just a symbol of, of great power, because the re the, we know he's fully human because he has to die. And that's the main difference, really, between the world of the divine and the world of the humans in this, early, in this early polytheistic culture. When they start to think about their gods, you see, we're talking about polytheism, but we're now talking about people within polytheism who are thinking about the polytheistic structure. And so they present us with these epics, and, with, and with, then later on when Socrates comes along, he tries to reform it all and purify it all and try to say, well, you know, what we call gods, really, they are all just mental, uh, me mental realities that our mind discovers, wisdom, not Athene, uh, justice, not Zeus, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the sea, not Poseidon, uh, uh, sex and the power of sex that it has over us and it's not that easy to, uh, okay, Ishtar, Athene, uh, Aphrodite, Zenus, uh, v Venus, uh, Haifa, uh, whoever is your latest uh, you know, sex symbol becomes a god, a, you know, a symbol for a god. So read this stuff as much as you can. Try to start to get uh, able to read things symbolically and not absolutely literally. You'll understand more what these people were saying. So what the people who give, gave us the epic of Gilgamesh seem to be saying, and you can just see it differently, but this is just one way to get you thinking about it all, is that perhaps what they saw in these gods were the, the, the great limitations of life. So many things, uh, you know, determine us, so many things we, we could not control, uh, all the whatever. And so they presented it in this work specifically for the human being. 
not necessarily you know, to develop a wonderful theology or something like that, but for the sake of human beings living in a culture who believed in these gods. Okay, if you are worshiping these gods, you're believing these gods, what can you do as a human being? All right? You've got to be afraid of them, you've got to be careful, you never know what's going to happen. As the story tells you, uh, he doesn't get much help. Uh, focus on the, uh, on the meeting with, uh, with Ishtar. Let me just put the picture of Ishtar a little bit there. I'm going, you know, I'm not being able to, uh, you know. Ishtar wants to marry him. You know, oh, he's a handsome guy. <coughs> and he refuses. Idiot. You know, if you marry a, a goddess, you become immortal. Truly immortal, not just two-thirds God and one-third man, the symbol. You become, you know, she offers him all the things that a goddess can offer him. All right? Read that passage carefully as one text study when you get to it, the meeting between Ishtar and Gilgamesh. And no, see how the, the authors or how, you know, in that text we have, that's all we have from there, we have that text. Look at as an exercise, look at that text. And if that text is accurate, what, the, what we get there is... This is a focusing on the human being. Human beings are offered wonderful things, Mahek. Follow this Zayim, get into this party, do that, do this, you know, we'll give you stuff. As soon as they finish with you, psh, like a squeezed lemon, they get rid of you. This is the, the sad story of many students during the war, all right? They'd be convinced to do something for somebody, and then once they stopped needing them, the Zayim or the party would just forget about them, all right? So that's what you're getting there in that kind of an episode there. Here is a big boss, one of the big bosses, one of the biggest bosses, okay, Ishtar, she wants to marry him. He responds in a very interesting way. He responds rationally. He tries to present her with a rational argument. Why, it just wouldn't make sense for me to marry you. Look, I'll do whatever you want else, but, but to marry you? So make sure you do read that text. It's a very interesting text. And see what, why, what is the source of his rejection? Why is he rejecting her and how is he arguing? for the rationality of it. Now, the next thing that you're getting there is a very interesting path when he, death. You see, death is going to be a very important thing. See, we're concerned with all of these items still today. We're still concerned with a dictator who can do whatever he likes. Because he can do whatever he likes, the people complain. Justice, this is not fair. So the gods, and I've been trying to tell you what the gods mean. The gods present him with an enkidu. Don't take this literally. What does an Enkidu represent? An equal, a friend, another human being. Now he can develop empathy. Before, there was no way for him to develop empathy because empathy means an equal, not pity. You know, I pity you, all right? But if I have empathy for you, it means in some way I'm really, uh, I'm setting you as equal to me, equal in respect, equal in worth, all right? And there's a, there's a kind of a communion there that there isn't when you just pity someone or you're just, you know, treating people functionally and whatever we do and most of the things. So empathy comes with Enkidu. Enkidu is his equal, very interesting story, you'll read it for yourself, but he dies for very, very interesting reasons. I leave the details to your study of Gilgamesh, but, but that's the text for this week. When he dies, now Pay attention to this. Now, this is an example of what is meant by when people use the term existential knowledge. Now he knows what he knows. He's, he's tasting death. Though, right? before uh, he knew he knew that you know everyone has to die, even him, even though he's two thirds god and one third man. You know, he goes he goes into battle, and his uh, Enkidu is afraid to go, but he tells him, you know, no, no, we all have to die, so let's at least get a great name. But now there's this big human shift of when he f finds death, he experiences death, and the death of his closest friend, and it's a horrible death. And this, this as he's dying, he has this dream, this is our only source, this is our main source in that book, for what happens to you when you die. Horror chamber, <laughs> a horrible place. Okay, we did this as a play here, so forgive me for uh, you know, getting into this in this kind of a way. All right, but it's, uh, he, when he when he dies, he's getting so. Now here are the facts. You know, we're interested in facts. Make rationality. We don't want to, you know, we want to be a rational human beings. All right, here are the facts in front of him: death, horrible. After I die, I'm going to a horrible place. No matter what I do, there's no differentiation between the great and the and, and the small, the whatever. Everybody, when you die, you go to this horrible place. Okay, well, 
He now wants to find some way of getting out of this mess, out of death. Everybody tells him, no, no, don't bother Gilgamesh because, you know, the gods tell him, the humans tell him, don't bother, nobody can get, uh, you know, nobody can, can conquer death because this, was on, this is only for humans, you know, the gods didn't give us this kind of thing. Does he submit and say, Wallah, mashi takia, ya mafia? Because there's no longer a god, you know, in any, any either philosophical sense or a monotheistic sense, you know, of a god that's, you know, a philosophical god like that for Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, you know, uh, perfection and goodness and, and, and all that, you know, or an Abrahamic god who supposedly is also in his forgiveness and mercy and compassion and love. Uh, no, you're talking about these gods, read them, and you know, you're talking about Ishtar, you're talking about them specifically. They, they, they're unfaithful to one another. The gods present a flood. They have presented a flood in the past. And the flood story is, antedates the one in the Bible. So the biblical one comes after this one, and so there are many parallels in it if you ever read the one in Genesis. But for you to understand what we do in CS, the whole point is what are they trying to express through these flood stories? So when you read the biblical one, you decide for yourself what you think the, the message for that people was from that flood story. But now you have this flood story. What's the message for human beings of why did this horrible flood happen that could have exterminated mankind? Okay, and so what happened, however, in that flood was one person survive, because if everybody went extinct, there'd be nobody to talk about it. So now the obvious question, how come we can still talk about the flood? Well, you have a flood story to, 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 to help the, the, the people who are in this culture to understand how things happen. Why do such horrible things happen? All right, again, analyze the flood story. It happens, the only thing they tell you in that text you have is because the gods were upset, was, there was too much of a aja, an uproar, uh, uh, and Leel couldn't sleep, ya haram. He, you know, he didn't have any uh, Valium or something else to help him sleep. You know, he, was, he was bothered, he couldn't sleep. But, but you know, read things and, and give, it, you know, give it meaning like this. This isn't being disrespectful. On the contrary, it's trying to understand the hum how the human being is thinking in a different context. All right? So that's the message for Mr. Uh, Gilgamesh. Finally, but, and for you, the humans. But Gilgamesh now rebels against the idea of a fixed fate. All right? The fate is that everybody has to die. And to die now like this, you see, when you think you have to die and you're still young and you're powerful, yeah, well, okay, you know, when I die, I'll worry about it. Uh, when you're actually facing it, okay, it becomes, you know, it becomes a, uh, you can't just get rid of it and put it on the shelf for another day. You have to solve it. And so, he does what he can do, and that's, that's, the, that's the message. Do whatever you can do. Don't, you know, give up. Do whatever you can do. What could he do? Well, he's using his mind. Utnapishtim survived. Utnapishtim is still, he's far, very, very far away, but I can, you know, I can go and access him. Science, empiricism. There's a fact there. I'm going to go and see what happened. Okay, so that I can... Think better about this whole business of I have to die and, and, and go to this horrible thing. So he's, you know, he takes the initiative. This is creativity. This is what leads to discovery of things in every field. When you come to a barrier, no, there are always some people that go through it. Or we wouldn't have where well, we have today in any of the fields we have. Because you know, there are always barriers. They say, Khalas, that's it. You know, we've reached this, we've reached this, we've reached this. You know, the Aristotelian view of the cosmos was, was accepted by everybody for many, many years until, you know, the, the scientific revolution and the stuff that came in and better instruments. And we started to look for things, not just accept what they seem to be or rationally. You start to look into things more empirically and you get an empathy with the, with, with the cosmos, with the nature. You start to see how they actually function in that sense. Okay, so he represents, therefore, the sir, and that's number one on the, on the bottom there. We have some of the people there. Gilgamesh, one way that you can access what was going there is that how do we get wisdom? We all want wisdom. We all are, in a sense, philosophers, lovers of wisdom by nature. You, you may disagree with that, but you know, we, we want wisdom. We don't, want for, we don't look for uh, untruth. We don't look for sort of, you know, uh, uh, we want wisdom, however we understand that wisdom is. So the lover for wisdom is not, reaching, not just 
getting a BA or a PhD or a writing wonderful books on, in whatever field you want, but rather becoming, this is the human pro, uh, growth. The, uh, the more human, the more human wisdom we pick up and access and process and make use of, that's one aspect of our maturity. And we can understand it through, even through these books we're reading, because each one is going to give us you know, a possible thing that we can think about, what we should do. So uh, that, that's you know, with Gilgamesh. The, with Odysseus, you go into uh, the model now of a proto-scientific exploration, the shrewd mind. When you get to Oedipus and Antigone, we do Oedipus nowadays. Uh, we get into the whole notion of political responsibility, the pursuit of truth at the cost of his own life. Uh, the, 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 he or she, both of them, the tragic truth, but by seeking the, the tragic truth, uh, Sophocles will be trying to tell you that look at what he has done for the polis. The polis was a Greek concept for the human, uh, for human community, and by the time of when we get to Athens and with Sophocles, Oedipus, the, the, living for the polis became very, very important. Because you can, uh, what happens to the polis happens to you. And what happens to you happens to the polis. There's no, you cannot separate yourself from the community you're living in. But a polis meant, uh, you know, first of all, for by, uh, by the time of Athens, a democratic community in whatever way they understood democracy at the time. But small enough so that everybody could be involved actively in the work of it. So it's really worthwhile to set that as one of your main goals in life is to be doing something for the polis, improving humanity, doing all that. And so in, bo in both of these works, and in the Oedipus that you read, others, don't just read it for the story of Oedipus, that's always interesting, and you, know, you can think about it any way you like. But if you put yourself into the shoes of Oedipus and, and trying to put yourself into the mind of Sophocles, what is he trying to show us through Oedipus, this is a model of democratic and political responsibility. That's one thing that people often miss when they read Oedipus. See, if you find it there, you, you may not find it there, but you know, there are many things you'll be finding through this. With Thucydides, the whole question of power and how the love of power always de uh, uh, defeats the love of truth and reason. And he shows this through his history of the Peloponnesian War, the greatest war that had ever happened to the Greeks. And he tries to show that one of the main, or the, the main reason for why Athens was, the democratic Athens was defeated by, uh, uh, by, by the dictatorship of uh, Sparta, the oligarchy, that was that they started to, they had a mind disease. Their mind went from loving truth and ready to sacrifice for it to loving power and ready to do anything for power, sacrificing truth for power or sacrificing power for the sake of truth. Might is right, might makes right, or does right give you true might and true power over time. So he's, this is an excellent, this is one of the most uh, influential works in this, in, uh, from this period, the, the Peloponnesian War of Thucydides, but it's very complex and it's very interesting, and I'm sure, I hope you will enjoy it. Socrates now, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, that's an important part of this course, will take you through primarily the change from the, <coughs> the simple, you know, a cultural view of the gods and as, uh, to the attempt to sort of give some meaning to these gods as we see in Gilgamesh, but now in the Greek world with Homer, Homer goes a step further and he actually organizes them. He creates the belief of the gods for an intellectual in, uh, in, in, in the Greek world. And so they all follow Homer in one way or another as they develop, as they change, all this, they are all following Homer's view that the, all these gods are just aspects of the cosmos, of the whole universe. And so there's one overarching power that governs the universe, the cosmos with its laws. It's lawful and ordered. And the gods simply, their main, their main thing to do is to keep the order. And the second thing is they're all limited. No one god can trespass on the limit of the other. So they have, you know, in a nice good I'm sorry I'm using this thing. In a, okay, in a company, you have the, you know, you have the, uh, you have the board of trustees, you have, the, you have various things there. I, I wanted to use more of the example of the mafia. I love the mafia. I'm Lebanese. I've been here all my life, you know, especially since the war. And so mafia always is in my mind. So don't, uh, forgive me if I use that thing. But, you know, in the mafia, there's the godfather, you know, and his word is final. Okay, and then there are these other lesser beings who are around him who can do enough, but they can't go beyond a certain limit. So Zeus never goes against the order of things in all of Homer. He never allows Zeus, the greatest of gods, 
All right? Never, he's, he has his limit and he keeps his limit. He can never change what the cosmos has designated for somebody. So, in the, in, especially in, in, the, in the Iliad, which we don't read, there it's much clearer. Whenever Zeus, because these gods took sides in a war, you know, if they were in, about Lebanon, we'd have some with, uh, on this side and some on that side. Or if they, some would be with, Mart with uh, Arbatash Adar and some would be with many Adar. You know, they, they took sides and they gave power. All right, to these people. But nobody had overarching power. They had to respect limits. And this is the, the gods of Homer, when you get to there. He limits them. He gives them definition. They say that. Herodotus says that in his history. He, he and Hesiod created the genealogy of the gods, giving them their attributes and their shape and, you know, and their limits. So uh, you see a change now. But what you see, the main idea here is when you talk about the divine, okay, you want to see why these things developed. Why did Socrates and Plato and Aristotle come to have their view of God? They, one of the reasons they executed Socrates, the democracy, huh? the, the, the failed democracy of Athens, actually condemned Socrates to death. One of the reasons they accused him of being an atheist. Hello? <laughs> they accused him of being an atheist and this means that you can dammu halal. You can kill him, you know, or you can put him in prison, or you can do something with him. And uh, this was the end of, uh, of Socrates. But what was Socrates doing? He was trying to make the, their religious life and their religious understanding more rational, more human, more understandable. All right? So he, the gods become, uh, with Plato, more clearly, all right? Athene, not wisdom. Justice, not Zeus, okay? Uh, you know, the, the various ones, they, they, he, he, they, the gods are there, you see. He wasn't an atheist. But you know, when you're worshiping a god, you're worshiping something worth worth worshiping. That's the, the, the stick there. And if, if you ever reach monotheism in 202, you'll see that this was also the, this dialogue between monotheism and, uh, and polytheism. Also, monotheism was one way of trying to uh, deal with polytheism at one level. And then in the Roman Empire, it became a way of trying to deal with philosophy. So there's always this ongoing interaction and dialoguing. But you've got to understand each one on its own, empathetically. Why is it coming up? What is the time it's coming up? Otherwise, you just get into this chauvinism of, well, I know everything, and I would have done that, and if I was Oedipus, I would, look, I would have meditated and looked into myself. I got that as an answer from a teacher, from a student last night. I would have meditated and gotten the truth through meditation, and then I would have known that I was a killer. Wonderful, but I mean, you lose the story of Oedipus. What does that have to do with Oedipus, the story? So I'm, I'm, I'm challenging you with these things. I'm sorry, especially for the faculty who have to listen to me, but uh, they, will do, they will correct my lecture with you. Uh, the basic thing, though, the, the rest of the things there is to give you an idea. The whole program went starting with all of this, giving you that basis. Then you move on to 202 on the next page, and you deal with you know, some of the uh, items like this. They're all under change now. And, uh, the third one, uh, b before we change this name to, I'm saying, the, the, you know, the, when it was a four semester sequence, it was called at one point modernity and the enlightenment, had different names, but you go into the early modern period and the later modern period and the scientific revolution, industrial revolution and the French revolution and, you know, and, and uh, into Marxism, into capitalism and socialism and Marxism, into, uh, into gender issues uh, already. And, and so you go into all sorts of things there, new political systems, uh, all sorts of new uh, approaches coming up in the modern world, basing themselves on things that have come from the past so if you don't know the things that you're coming from the past and you take a 203, you won't have any idea what these people are talking about. You just get their, uh, uh, their what's the word, their reinvention of what these, or their, their view of what happened in the past. Right? By taking your own study through these things, at least you start to become more and more able to be critical, you know, critical thinker. Critical thinker and critical involves empathy and your own evaluation. That's what critical means. Critical doesn't mean just to, just to contradict something or to do something like critical. First and foremost means you've really come to a deep understanding of the humans who presented this, all right? But now you are uh, yourself, a free human. You can compare it with other things in your own view and you can have a proper uh, critical dialogue and maybe help push things forwards. The last one, 204, takes you into the more recent things in the, uh, that, that developed in the 20th century more, and you can see them all there. Now, so, for skills and competencies, and you'll be getting, uh, the, your, your teachers will be giving you a, a reading schedule and a syllabus, which will have 
uh, you know, what, what a course like this try, what any CVSP course tries to do, but what this course is trying to, trying to do for you. Uh, they will tell you more specifically how, the, what, you know, what skills they wish you to be developing, because it's a university course, so you have to ha be handling it uh, in, a, in, in a professional way. Uh, so they will be helping you with that, and they will tell you what the skills are. And they will also take you further on into this discussion of how do we understand, how do we access other cultures, how do we access other humans, how do we access uh, great things from the past which we are benefiting from without ever saying thank you to anybody, <laughs> like we're parasites, we, they sacrificed for us, but now we, we're just taking... So, what these, all these things tell you, well, just like you've taken from them all, that's, that's your job now. You be as proactive as they were. Don't, you know, don't just accept some bosh about something. Look into it, you know. The unexamined life is not worth living, and especially in a course like this, never believe what we tell you in any particular course. <laughs> You, this is just to get you going, so you can start going into all of this and recognize how, you know, how, how deep it is, so that you can arm yourself against slogans and, and the latest uh, fashion and things like that. Let me just take you very quickly, if you have another minute, through some of these slides. Uh, that's where we start in ancient Mesopotamia. You get the Epic of Gilgamesh from peoples there. Uh, I, I won't go into all the details. Uh, Ishtar. Uh, then you go into the, uh, this is just one thing from the Odyssey, the Cyclops, that's, you're going to meet him and it's just to whet your taste for it. <laughs> a very important passage, by the way, in, 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 uh, and when you read the, the Homer the, with the Cyclops, state of the art revenge, when the whole thing ends with this great revenge, dam you know, blood way up to your head, <laughs> okay, feeding their private parts to the dogs. And you know, but it's all orderly. It's within the order of the cosmos. So you see, you have to, you can't, put your own moral views into some other moral view. From their point of view, what the suitors had been doing was horrible. And so they deserve to get this kind of revenge. When at the end, the nurse, but Zalrit, do any of you Zalrit, when you know, a triumphal cry, uh, he stops her. No, 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 that's not pious. <laughs> you know, he's been, chopping off their private parts and feeding them to dogs and slaying everybody. That's part of the order. So order, you have to see what order, what does it mean, why is it, why do they think of it that way, etc. It's not to kind of confuse you, but rather to confuse you in a positive way. Don't think things are as simple as they seem. You do need to put some effort. Herodotus in the Athens, the, prior, the Acropolis, uh, the great, you know, great things happened in the 100 period, the golden age of Pericles you'll be coming into with, uh, with, with meeting Socrates in philosophy, Sophocles in tragic and tragedy, and Thucydides in history, uh, Oedipus and Ant you know, Antigone deal with this kind of a stuff. This is how, when you come to Oedipus, remember it's a play. So when you read it, do immediately before you start reading it, remember this is a play. You're not going to really, really get the heart of this particular work until you really see it being produced and being produced, you know, well, because uh, but some, some do it better than others. But uh, th these are just, just a, one picture from how Greek tragedy is performed uh, in, the modern, in, in, the, in the present day. Uh, the Peloponnesian War, the legal assassination of Socrates. See, in democracy we go by law, all right? And so by law and legally, they voted to sentence him to death. So this is the problem that people face all the time. Yeah. We, I know you have heard of a man named Solzhenitsyn, Russian uh, thing. When he went to America, all the right-wing Americans thought he was going to be really talking against the Soviet Union all the time and all of this. He spent most of his time when he left speaking about the problems of capitalism and the, <laughs> and the American system where you know, it's legal to sell this drug that is going to harm you. But it's legal, you know, it's, got, it's passed through the FDA and, uh, you know, until you can do that. Uh, for the time being, if it affects people, you know, uh, too bad, that's part of the system. This is where socialism and communism and uh, all other reactions against uh, sort of raw capitalism come in. But capitalism, of course, has, 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 has developed well beyond raw capitalism. Plato and Aristotle, then into Rome. At the end of the semester, you do Rome, and we have very little time for it, but Rome is primarily Greek in its culture, but it has its own specific uh, it has its own specific qualities, uh, but so you'll get that through primarily the great epic poem, uh, the Aeneid of uh, uh, <laughs> Virgil's Aeneid and the, the Stoic hero there. How should you live your life? Well, um, like a good Stoic, like 
uh, is presented in that hero. Uh, Epicureanism <clears throat> will give you another option, maybe the one you really like most. You know what it is to really be intelligent? It's to believe in Epicureanism. Because if you believe them, it will solve all your problems. There are no, there, you know, gods are not concerned with you. Gods are interested in their own pleasure, their own comfort. They could care less about you. They exist, they appear here and there, but you know, they're not interested. What's life all about? Maximizing intelligently your pleasure and minimizing intelligently your, uh, your pain. And if you really follow that pro process, get out of politics, choose your friends, don't have too many friends. You know, it's a, it's a nice formula. And fi finally, for both Stoicism and Epicureanism, you will see, they both said, well, you know, if you try our formula, because they're both formulae at the end of the semester, they inspire many things, but as, as, as ways of life and as a philosophy of life, they're both formulas. If you accept them and you, you put your faith in them and live according to them, you'll get peace of mind. Global world. The Rome was a global world. Empire. We're living in a global village today. Anxiety. Uh, all the things that you know, you're know you all experiencing by living in this, okay? Come to us, said the Stoic. Come to us, said the Epicurean. Both of them Greek philosophies, but never popular in Greece. Now in Rome, the global world, no longer the polis, just the, the city-state, they, uh, they became much more popular than ever before. And you'll get peace of mind. Okay? Avoid anxiety in the mind and pain in the body. That's how you should live. Forget about, uh, you know, there's no, you know the, the truth is the truth that makes you happy. That's what truth is. And uh, falsehood is that which gives you pain. Anyway, the whole point of all this is that this is the one place where you can maybe have a rest from having being challenged to try to be the best and to try to serve society and to try to be, you know, a somebody and not a nobody and all that. With Epicureanism, it's the sort of, you know, come on, let's stop, you know, Hamlin Silum Bilard. I'm sorry when I rush into Russian, but, you know, there is that expression. Silum Bilard, you know. Do you know? Have you ever heard of it? None of us heard of it. It means, you know, come on, take it easy, lighten up. Just use your mind in a, in a, in a good way and have, good, have just enough friends who are, won't give you too much trouble. Don't get involved in politics. Have sex, but make sure it's safe. <laughs> Don't fall in love. Love just gives you more and more trouble. All right? These are the, some of the packages of, we used to do Epicureanism fully. Now you're going to get it just in some selections in the, at the end of the semester. The, all of these are wonderful uh, uh, things for you to study in depth and don't, uh, don't let me influence you. Um, don't everybody rush out to be an Epicurean. I mean, do, do give some chance to the others which are challenging us to try to be a somebody and do something for humanity and, and all that. Thank you for your attention. I'm sure I've, I'm over time. I'm not sure, but... I, ne I, never, I don't have a clock up here. It's okay, I'm, I'm on time. Thank you, have a great semester, and when you meet your, your teachers,